talk about creation machines. Um, and the basic idea of, of this work that we've been promoting to looking around the room, a lot of you already, um, is that the excitement and hype around AI isn't as scary as it seems. Okay. So wherever you go, there's some sense that there's excitement around this technology. It's going to be transformative. It's going to be different. It's going to really matter. And at the same time, we keep hearing, well, wait, you know, if it, the machine's intelligent, but what about me? I said that was my job. If the machine's the intelligent part, then what happens to humans? A lot of this both excitement and anxiety comes down to a lot of confusion about what really we're talking about. What is AI? If you read the press, you have some sense that on the friendly side, maybe we have C-3PO. So what's C-3PO? C-3PO is a robot, an AI, that does pretty much everything a human can do, uh, except it listens to humans, right? So humans may not listen to humans, C-3PO listens to humans. Otherwise, uh, the robots can do everything a human can do. Or maybe we get Skynet or the Matrix, where um, the machines just take over. Now, I actually don't think truly intelligent machines is a crazy idea. But I do know that they've been 50 years away since 1956. And they continue to be about 50 years away. So that's not the technology we're talking about today. The technology we're talking about today is prediction technology. The reason we're talking about AI in 2018, and we were not talking about AI in 2008 or 1998 or even 1988 with the same level of excitement, is because of recent advances in commercial applications of machine learning, which is a particular technology that facilitates prediction. Now, to get a sense of why prediction might be a big deal, let's go back a generation of technology and talk about the internet. So, um, half the room, I think, remembers 1995, the other half may not. A little bit of history lesson, 1995 was a very exciting year in technology. That was the year that um, the last public aspects of the internet, the MSF net, were privatized in the U.S. That was the year of Netscape's IPO, where they were valued at over a billion dollars with zero profit. That seems truly crazy in 1995. Now it just seems a little bit unusual, but then it was uh, unheard of. And it was the year of Bill Gates' internet tidal wave email, where he acknowledged that Microsoft missed this fundamental technology, and that from now on, that would be the core of Microsoft's business strategy. The future of software, the future of computing, from the point of view of the software computing company of the time, was the internet. So the world seemed to change. And the hype built in 1996 and 1997, people continued to get more and more excited about this technology. To the point where they stopped calling it a new technology, and people started to call it a new economy. Now, when you read the press, when you saw the stock valuations, you heard this idea that the old rules didn't apply. We can reject our old textbooks. We can reject the economics and turn to new ideas, new ways of thinking, ignore the old rules of valuation. Now, there was one group of people who said it's not a new economy at all. This is the same old economy, which is the cost of some things at all. Who's that? That's, that's the economist. That's us, right? We said it's not a new economy. We can understand what's changed by just recognizing that the cost of certain things has fallen. Search is easier than it used to be. Communication is easier than it used to be. And replication, copying, is easier than it used to be. And once you understand that, you can fully understand what would play out. And so if replication is cheap, economists were predicting at, the same, at this time, that, okay, you know what? Copyright's going to be a really big deal. And privacy is something we should pay attention to because it's so easy to copy information. Those predictions turned out to be very true. We understood what the consequences of it drop in the cost of something would be, and could see how it would play out. Now let's jump back another generation and think about this. Think about the semiconductor. Think about the computer. What does your computer do? In essence, what does your computer really do? It only does one thing. Your computer adds. That's it. You think your computer does all these wonderful things? Well, it kind of does all these wonderful things. But it only does those wonderful things because it's really good at arithmetic. So you can think about advances in computing as a drop in the cost of arithmetic. Cheap arithmetic turned out to be transformative. It got so cheap that we started to use arithmetic 
for all sorts of things, for all sorts of problems that we might not have thought of as arithmetic problems. This is economics 101, right? This is demand curve slope down. This is where the cost of something falls, we do more of it. In this case, because arithmetic is so transformative, such a big deal, when the cost of arithmetic fell extraordinarily, we ended up finding extraordinary applications for arithmetic. Now, the first applications for machine arithmetic were the exact same as the first applications for human arithmetic. We had cannons, fundamentally, in World War II in the immediate aftermath, and they shot cannonballs. And it turned out to be a really difficult arithmetic problem to figure out where those cannonballs landed. And so, we had teams of humans, who we called computers, right? Movie Hidden Figures, you saw these people, they were, they were computers. They were humans whose job was called computer. And they calculated the trajectory of those cannonballs. But as arithmetic became cheaper, machine arithmetic became cheaper, we started to have machines do that instead of humans. Then, we came for accounting. It used to be a key job of the accountant, if our extraordinary accounting professor right here, a key job of the accountant was to add, right? That's what accountants did, they subtracted to. But that was kind of, that was a good chunk of their time. A classic homework problem, as I understand it, in university in the 1940s and 1950s, if you were studying accounting, was to open the white pages of the phone book, the phone book take a column of numbers, and add them up. Why? Because that's what you would be spending a good chunk of your life doing after graduation, arithmetic. But when machine arithmetic became cheap, we stopped using humans to do that kind of arithmetic. The good news is there's still plenty of accountants around. Why? Because the people who were best positioned to do the arithmetic were also the people who were best positioned to understand the consequences of it and leverage it for strategic value. Now, as arithmetic became cheaper, we started to realize there's all these other applications for arithmetic that we might not have dreamed of. Games, mail, music, pictures. It turns out all of these are arithmetic problems. And most of us but with the one exception of Anna Lovelace, who figured it out 200 years ago, with, with the exception of her, the rest of us didn't think of these as arithmetic problems until arithmetic became cheaper. So that gets us to today's technology. This is a representation of a convolutional neural net. This is one of the technologies underlying the current excitement around AI. This is a, vision, a visual, in essence, of deep learning. So we should think about this as a drop in the cost of prediction. That's what's changed. Prediction is now cheap. And just like as arithmetic became cheap, we start to find all these new applications for arithmetic. As prediction gets cheap, we're starting to find all sorts of new applications for prediction. Prediction is not necessarily about the future. Prediction is prediction in the statistical sense. It is using information you have to fill in information you don't have. It could be about the future, but it could also be about the present or the past. When you want to visualize that, think about the classic prediction tool in um, magic and history, right? The crystal ball. Now think about the visual of crystal balls in movies. Many of you, I imagine, are thinking about the Wizard of Oz. What is the crystal ball used for in the Wizard of Oz? It is for predicting the present. It's for Dorothy to know what Auntie Anne is doing, or for the witch to know what the monkeys are doing, or Dorothy to do. It's predicting the present. Prediction, even historically, even before we started to think about stats and prediction machines and all this, was about filling in missing information. It's about getting information what you didn't know, whether it was the past, present, or the future. So as predictions gotten cheap, we found all sorts of new applications for prediction that we might not have dreamed of. We started with the old-fashioned applications. You walk into a bank, you want a loan, uh, the, the bank has to figure out if you're going to default. So they predict whether you're going to default. That's an old-fashioned prediction problem. Insurance, in fact, much of statistics were invented in order to facilitate insurance contracts. So this is an old-fashioned prediction problem. But as predictions gotten cheaper, we've recognized there's a whole bunch of things that we might not have thought of as prediction problems. It turns out Medical diagnosis is a prediction problem. What does your doctor do? They take information, they take data about your symptoms, and they fill in the missing information of the cause of those symptoms. Prediction's gotten cheaper. We found a new application for prediction. Object classification, facial recognition, that's a prediction problem. How do I know that that is melody? Well, my eyes take in uh, light, essentially, signals, information. 
They process that information, they put in a label, melody, and a context. We're here. And it turns out autonomous driving is a prediction problem. A key part of using prediction machines and using them well is this art of moving from thinking about something as not a prediction problem to recognizing it could be reframed as a prediction problem. Yes, driving is prediction in the sense that you've got to predict what all those other crazy drivers are doing. But the key insight, driving, shouldn't use that word, okay. I'm not sure. Driving the current advances in AI, the key insight is that all we have to do is predict what a good human driver would do. And once we can predict what a good human driver would do, we can have the machine drive. And we're only a few years in, and there's going to be all sorts of new applications, new ideas, new brilliant insights that help us take advantage of these machines. Now, prediction is valuable because it's an input into decision making. Decision making is everywhere, right? You make decisions all the time, you make decisions. Uh, what job should I take? Should I marry? Should I have kids? When should I retire? And you make small decisions like, should I scratch my face? Should I write that down? These sorts of things. And so decision making is everywhere. But prediction is not decision making. And so we try to think through what are the opportunities for humans, for our jobs, and what are the assets that are valuable to our organizations, we need to recognize these other aspects of decision making that are now going to become more valuable because prediction is cheap. So just like when coffee gets cheap, cream and sugar become more valuable, we need to ask, what are the cream and sugar for prediction? So Econ 101 concept number one is demand curves up downward. Cheap coffee means we buy more coffee. Cheap prediction means more prediction. Another thing to recognize is cheap coffee means cream and sugar become more valuable. So what are the complements? What's the equivalent to cream and sugar for prediction? And one of the key aspects of that is something we call judgment. So here's our anatomy of a decision. There's you know, prediction at the center, here's the title of the book, Prediction Machines. Um, there's different kinds of data. There's the action. And now I want to talk about judgment, which is a key thing that humans can be doing. So what do we mean by judgment? Judgment is figuring out which predictions to make and what to do with them once we have them. I think this idea is best exemplified by uh, the movie iRobot. Have you seen that movie? Yeah, okay. So it was a fine movie. It wasn't a great movie. Okay. But it was a great movie for showing you what prediction machines can be. Okay. And it was that in a particular way, in a particular context. So there's a scene. Will Smith is the star of the movie. And it's a flashback scene. And he's remembering this time. He was in a car accident. He went over a bridge into a river. And it was him and a little girl, a 12-year-old girl in the car. And the car was sinking. And it looked like they were both going to die. Then a robot comes along and saves Will Smith and not the little girl. The little girl drowns. And Will Smith is angry. And he looks at the data and he goes back and says, why did the robot make that decision? The robot recognized that I, as an adult male, had a 45% chance of survival from that cold water. And that little girl had only an 11% chance. And so the robot saved me because I had a higher chance of survival. And then he goes on to say the robot made a mistake. A human would have known that. The girl should have been saved and not me. 11% is enough. And maybe 11% is enough. But at some point, he would say that it would have been better to rescue him and not the girl. Whether it's 6% chance the girl survives, or 1% chance the girl survives, or 0.1% chance the girl survives. I don't know what it is. But at some point, his judgment would be that that difference in probability, his life, okay, he's saying his life is worth less than a quarter of the girl's life. But is it less than a tenth? Is it less than a hundredth? The point is, when you implement prediction machines, you actually have to decide. You just get, the machine just gives you a prediction. It gives you a probability. Figuring out what to do with that, the valuation, is human. And that is going to be a key aspect of any human job going forward. These other inputs change the value. Now, in the book, we then go on to talk about once you think about this reduction in prediction to, um, and the cost of prediction, and the magazine article as well, I should add, um, how does this change firm strategy? What are the compromises you make as a company because of uncertainty? And in 12 minutes, I'm not going to go into that. That will be a teaser. But essentially, you can think about all these compromises you do. I'm about to go to the airport. I'm going to sit in an airport night. Why am I doing that? Because I have a bad prediction about how long it's going to take to get to the airport. There's all these little things that happen because of bad prediction. 